Hello, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. Campaigners call for a 20 mile an hour speed limit outside schools as the latest figures show 27 children are killed or injured on Yorkshire's roads every week. Owen's gone to cross the road, but he'd only put his leg out and they hit his leg. If that car had have hit him at the 20 mile an hour, he'd have still been here. We speak to parents and children about their fears. Also tonight, eight wildfires in the past few months. So how can future blazers on Marsden Moor be prevented? Here at Huddersfield Town a short time ago, Neil Warnock has just walked back in to take charge of the team for what he's calling just one more year. Join us shortly to find out whether you believe him or not. We hear from Rob Burroughs' children as they plan to make this year's Father's Day one to remember. What a fantastic day it's been and do you know what, if I had the day off, I might be playing golf. Look at Wakefield Golf Club, it looks an absolute picture. So, with news of more sunshine, but a hint of a change by the end of the weekend, join me for the very latest. Hello there, it's Wednesday the 14th of June. Thank you for your company this evening. First tonight, 27 children are killed or injured on Yorkshire's roads every week. That's shocking, isn't it? That's according to data from the road safety charity Brake. They're now calling for a 20 mile per hour speed limit to be imposed on all roads near schools to try and keep children safe. We called all our councils and just one, Calderdale, had a mandatory 20 miles per hour zone around all their schools. The latest figures show almost 1,300 children were killed or injured on roads in Yorkshire and the Humberside in 2021. And according to Brake, excess speed is a factor in a quarter of fatal crashes. Mark Ansell has our top story. It were amazing. Gorgeous blue eyes. He walked into a room and he lit it up, but he just shone. Six-year-old Owen Whiteman from Wakefield was hit by a car while playing close to his home in 2011. Somebody came here to alert us of what had happened. Obviously, we got to the scene and was hoping that we could hear him crying and screaming. And when we got there, there was no sound. The car was being driven at 57 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. We went to hospital and then within 20 minutes he came to us and they just said, I'm really sorry, but he's gone. His life were only just beginning. The 22-year-old driver didn't stop. He was given a five-year prison sentence for causing death by dangerous driving. Owen's gone to cross the road, but he'd only put his leg out and they hit his leg. If that car had have hit him at 20 mile an hour, he'd have still been here. Yorkshire Road Safety Charity Brake is calling for a 20 mile an hour speed limit to be imposed on all roads near schools. If you crash a car at 30 miles an hour, uh, it has twice the amount of kinetic energy as a car crashing at 20 miles an hour. Uh, stopping speeds, if you were stopping speed at 30 miles an hour, it stops at 20, it's 23 metres. 20 miles an hour, it's 12 metres. So there, there's big differences between the two speeds. Children at Wickersley Northfield Primary in Rotherham have been monitoring speeds outside their school. I think it's very important as there's loads of children around as it's a school, a really busy school, so I think it's very important to be a lower speed limit so everyone's safe. Two students at Rossett School in Harrogate suffered life-changing injuries in February this year when they were walking to school. A car ploughed into them on the pavement and then hit a wall. We haven't seen anything quite on this scale before, but there have been a number of other accidents or incidents in the local area and a lot of near misses. And I think that's the thing that sometimes goes unreported, um, that lots of children, particularly um, adults as well, have, have come very close to having um, very significant injuries or being killed on local roads. Parents are supporting the campaign for a blanket 20 mile an hour speed limit on roads around schools. There's so much traffic here. There's people drive way too fast. Most of the roads outside the schools are actually 30 mile an hour limits. Um, of course, when there's big secondary schools, you get massive groups of teenagers. They're not always very aware of what's going on around them. 
pavements can be narrow. It's pretty scary. Campaigners say they won't stop until drivers are made to slow down near children. Mark Ansell, BBC Look North. Next night, junior doctors have begun another three days of strikes today, with staff in York warning more will follow unless the government improves its pay offer. The BMA called the government's 5% pay offer paltry. Hospital bosses say don't go to A&E unless you absolutely have to, as you'll face even longer waits than usual over the next three days. Phil Connell has sent this report from York. Claps don't pay the bills. Claps don't pay the bills. It's the third strike by junior doctors, and for those on the picket line at York District Hospital this morning, there was still support from plenty of passing drivers. <laughs> Amongst those striking this week is Alex Brightmore. He's been a junior doctor in York for eight years and says the workload has now reached an unbearable level. I've noticed that I've had to go off sick with, with stress before. Um, I've noticed that I'm getting, I get burnout and I find that at times I will have people telling me heartbreaking stories and I will want to care but I, I have nothing left in the tank and that in and of itself just breaks me. The trust that runs hospitals in York and Scarborough says emergency treatment will be a priority and plans are in place to ensure patient safety during the strike. Many routine procedures, though, have been cancelled, so it's support from patients beginning to wane. I have friends that have been waiting that have cancer, and that's very serious, isn't it? And they've been waiting months, and it's been cancelled, so they've had to wait again. And you're here for a procedure today. You hope that's not been impacted? Well, um, I hope not, but um, if it was, I wouldn't blame the, the people on strike because um, they're not striking uh, recklessly. They, they're doing it as, I think, very much a last resort. It's always been a hard job, but the, the pressures on the NHS are absolutely at a all-time high at the moment and morale is at an all-time low. It's really tough out there. Claps don't pay the bills. The government says their pay offer is reasonable and all they can afford, but junior doctors are threatening more strikes to compensate for what they say is 13 years of below inflation wages. Phil Connell, BBC Look North, York. Well, it's certainly beautiful and warm out there, isn't it? But firefighters have been out tackling a blaze on the moors in West Yorkshire. The fire broke out last night at Harden Moor near Keithley. It's the latest in a spate of wildfires over the past few months. Tonight, police, firefighters and moorland rangers are attending a public meeting to discuss blazes on Marsden Moor. Abby Giola is there for us now. Abby, just remind us what's been happening. Well, the village of Marsden is surrounded by more than 5,000 acres of moorland. It's an area of special scientific interest because of the habitat it uh, is for wildlife. Now, in the last few months since February, there have been eight fires. The National Trust say that's unusual. The most recent was on Friday. Fire crews are still up there keeping an eye on things and making sure that the peat that's deep underground doesn't reignite. And there is a concern that some of these fires haven't been accidental. Earlier, I spoke to the fire service. We're still working with West Yorkshire Police who are investigating two of the fires um, as arson. Uh, we are still working with them to investigate the other fires, uh, but as I've kind of said previously, it's very difficult sometimes uh, to get a real conclusion of what, the, what started the fires. So what's been happening there in Marsden tonight? Well, there is a public meeting. It's been organised by the National Trust, the fire service and the police. We've been seeing people heading into the hall behind me. Now, the meeting is to keep people informed, to let them know what's been happening with those investigations and also to talk about what's been done to prevent the fires and to protect the landscape. And what's really key, they say, is that the public help them. We have a, an amazing group of volunteers and rangers who regularly patrol, um, but what we would like to ask the local community is to please help us out even more. Be, please be our eyes and ears if they see smoke or if they see a barbecue, call 999. Um, it doesn't matter how often it's called in, um, your call might be the first call and the Fire and Rescue Service will respond immediately. 
Well, obviously the weather is causing concern as well. It's dry, it's hot and it's windy. So if there were a fire, it could cause a real issue. So the message tonight is be vigilant. Abby, thank you. A man has appeared in court today where he admitted destroying a replica plaque in memory of a British Nigerian man who drowned after being chased by police. It was the third time the blue plaque had been vandalised. Chloe Lavasuch was in court. Gregory Palmer appeared here at Leeds Magistrates Court this morning, charged with criminal damage of a replica blue plaque that was put up on Leeds Bridge last year in memory of David Oluwale. 60-year-old Mr Palmer pleaded guilty to criminal damage and the court heard that CCTV showed him ripping the plaque off the wall and throwing it into the river air last July. But he claimed he saw offensive language on the plaque and that's why he threw it into the river. He's also charged with racially aggravated criminal damage in relation to another offence last year and he's due to appear back here at Leeds Magistrate Court for further hearings in October. Police say another man aged in his 30s, who was arrested on suspicion of taking the original plaque, remains under investigation. Chloe Lavasuch, BBC Look North at Leeds Magistrates Court. The contest to find a new MP for Selby and Ainsty in North Yorkshire has started. The process in the House of Commons began earlier with the Conservatives officially calling for the election. No date has been set yet, but it's expected to be in late July. The election was triggered by the sudden resignation of the former Selby MP Nigel Adams, a big ally of Boris Johnson who himself stood down late on Friday. Two of our region's schools have had their artwork displayed outside the Tower of London. The historic royal palaces ran a competition to mark the coronation of King Charles by designing a royal bench. Two of the winners were the Dacre Braithwaite Primary School in Harrogate, as well as the Year 5 class at Morelands Primary in Huddersfield. And beautiful they are too. Well, it's been another glorious day, hasn't it? The flowers are in bloom, the sun is out, and so are the antihistamines. This week, the Met Office warned of a high pollen count, and by the huge response we've had from you, many of our viewers are suffering with hay fever too. Margaret Kelvin is a specialist allergy nurse and hopefully can offer some hay fever advice to us all. So many people, Margaret, have been in touch on Twitter via email saying this year in particular, they're symptoms are so much worse it's true for me why is that well we know that over the last kind of few years we've obviously had warmer temperatures you know with climate change but we also find that on days like we've got the moment warm sunny days you've got a gentle breeze and it's very dry plants produce more pollen and that means there's more circulating pollen in the atmosphere and it's there's nothing to wash away we need rainwater to help disperse or wash away that pollen to lower the pollen count Joanne Toy's been in touch. She says, my daughter's 14, suffering terribly at the moment. She's taking one antihistamine a day. She says it's just not doing the trick. She um, dries clothing indoors, keeps inside as much as possible, uh, also closing the windows and doors. Is there anything else you can suggest? If she's got a kind of stuffy nose, then maybe to, um, try a nasal corticosteroid that she could you know, go and see the doctor or a practice nurse and see if that would be suitable. Other things to help that really do help is um, when you're coming in from outside, take your outside clothing off and then go and have a shower and wash your hair. And that just takes all those pollens and washes them away. You can also try um, nasal ir douching or irrigation and that's squirting saline saline solution up your nose and that helps to wash out any pollens that have been caught in the nose. You can also do the same for the eyes and drop um, eye drops and um, sterile saline eye drops just to wash out the eyes. But other things you can do is when you've got pets make sure you're wiping pets down with their damp uh, microfiber cloth before they come inside to stop them bringing the, the pollen as well. Gary Copley says I suffer early February to around early April. Why is that? That's probably more to do with tree pollens. So tree pollens are really, really in bloom in, in the springtime. And if you're starting to suffer hay fever now, it's probably more to do with grass pollens or even weed pollens um, that are kind of going to go right up until kind of um, early August. Bethina says uh, it's mainly the eyes for her. She wakes up uh, barely a a able to open her eyes. She has been using a spray. It's not working. Anything else she can try? Obviously, as I said, um, you, you try eye drops so you can get mast cell stabiliser eye drops for eyes. You can also try a little bit of kind of um, ointment, vas Vaseline ointment or um, greasy ointment and apply that around the eyes. And that helps to protect that, the skin around the eyes so that when you start to rub, 
um, it, you make your eyes water, and when the eyes water, they break down the skin around the eyes. So you're just protecting and putting a barrier around the eye as well. That's a brilliant advice. Richard says his his dog suffers. Is there anything he can give pets? Didn't realise pets got hay fever. <laughs> Yes, pets do get hay fever. I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm not a vet, but if you've got a pet that does have hay fever, it's probably a good day to visit your vet because there are some antihistamines that are suitable for animals. Margaret, we need to have you back on the show. That was brilliant. Loads of great advice. Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's bring you a bit of sport now. After pulling off the achievement of his career, keeping Huddersfield Town in the Championship last season, Neil Warnock has now signed a one-year deal to remain with the club. The 74-year-old retired from the game, believe it or not, in 2022, but it seems he just can't keep away. Paul Ogden has been chatting with him. Amy, I'd never said this was an exclusive, but it's definitely unexpected because when Neil Warnock told us at the end of last season that he wouldn't do another full season at Huddersfield Town or anywhere, I believed him. And I still believe you in some ways, Neil. What's changed your mind? It was just the last, the two games, the Sheffield United game, after that game, the response I got from the fans was, uh, I've never had anything like that in my whole career. Uh, and, and it just makes sense with the new owners coming in. They didn't want a new manager that didn't know any of the squad. Uh, so I felt obliged to, to try and help the club and just, just persevere. And you know me. And once I got the bit between my teeth, I'm off now. But you, I believed you as well last season when you said about having to look after yourself a bit more, about how you wanted to go fishing and ride your bike. Can you do this 46-game slog up and down the motorway, Ipswich away on a Tuesday night? I know. Well, I've just got to find a nice pond to fish around, around home Firth or around here. I'm sure I'll find one. Um, and there's all sorts to do now, but I've committed myself now, and so you can't be half-outed. And, uh, yes, I, I know it's going to be difficult. You look at the teams coming into the league now, and, you, you, you know, I, I look at our squad, and, you know, we, we, we did struggle a little bit last year. But all, overall, I think we've just got to be excited. I look at all the teams I've managed that's in my league <laughs> and I know all the response I'm going to get when I turn up at their grounds. So I'm looking forward to it now and uh, we'll give it our best shot. As long as the lads give everything, they can't complain. Have you warned the lads, your players, that you're coming back, by the way? No, they'll. Uh, some of them might only know today. So we'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see. There has been rumours, but uh, I'm sure they'll enjoy it. That fixture list you talk about now includes Leeds United, of course, in the Championship. Sheffield Wednesday did a great job just about seeing off Barnsley in the playoff final. That's certainly going to add something to the Championship, isn't it? Oh, massive clubs, you know, and I can't begin to tell you. I, I look forward to going back there. I mean, I will get a nice response from the crowds, I'm sure, about <laughs> all these clubs. Uh, but that's where I'm in the game. I'm in the game for that. You know, it's enjoyable. You know, we've got to smile and put people, you know, put smiles back on people's faces, and and that's what football should be. And Yorkshire's a great place, you know, great place for this kind of. You know, I'm sure people will give me a bit of stick at times. I don't think you'd have them any other way, would you? No. Our position fans especially, Neil. Welcome home Thank you very to much. Yorkshire as much as anything. Thank you. Uh, I know certain other opposition Yorkshire fans who would also have Neil Warnock back as their manager tomorrow, if they could. Uh, as for Huddersfield Town, they'll find out, like everybody else, who their opponents are on the Championship fixture list this time next week. Augie, thank you. 74 and still loving it, isn't he? Now, two teenagers from West Yorkshire are celebrating after becoming world mountain running champions. Rebecca Flaherty and Amelie Lane, both 17 from Bradford Grammar School, competed in the World Mountain and Trail Running Championships at the weekend, where they clinched team gold in the under-20s women's up and downhill race in Innsbruck in Austria. They're here with us now, showing off their medals. Congratulations, girls. Thank you. How was it? It was amazing. Um, the whole experience was just incredible uh, and the race was surreal. I mean, they ran us through Innsbruck Old Town to finish and there were just hundreds of people you know, cheering us on and clapping and it was so memorable, a moment I won't forget. Emily, I think we can see here, you starting on that start line and then you hit a hill straight away. Oh my goodness, what was the actual race like? Uh, it started in the town and then we went up uh, like an uphill trail uh, and back down trail. Trail was like rocky in places, but it's, we managed, it's quite, we're used to technical terrain here in Yorkshire. Uh, yeah, then, I mean for Yorkshire, running in Yorkshire, how does that compare to Innsbruck? Uh, it's a bit colder here. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really helped us having the practice on the moors here. Um, because we're lucky that we can just go for a run out our doors and hit the hills and practice there. Um, Emily, what was the highlight for you? 
Uh, I think maybe the medal ceremony at the end. Uh, we stood on the podium as a team and sung the national anthem. Uh, and then in the audience, there was like all the rest of Team GB waving the flags and cheering for us. Oh, fantastic. What a brilliant moment for you both. And we can see the pictures of that finish now. Wow, fun. Is that you there? I think yes. it might be. Well done, Rebecca. Of course, you, you clinched gold. Wow, what a moment that must have been. Now, let's talk a little bit about your school, because you're not the first athletes to come from there, are you? The Brownlee brothers, of course, went to um, Bradford Grammar as well. Yes. How much is athletics part of the day-to-day -day at the school? Uh, it's a huge part of the school. Um, I mean, we're so lucky that we have such great facilities and support from the school itself. Um, and the teachers are really understanding and are able to, you know, give us extra catch-up sessions if we've missed school because of internationals or extend deadlines if we've been out training hard over the weekend. So it's really helpful. And, Emily, you're studying for your A-levels, aren't you, at the moment? Mm -hmm. How do you fit all of this training around schoolwork? Because I assume you've got to be out running a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I'd say, like, it's time, ma time management is really important, but the teachers are really understanding, so that helps a lot. And they, they've just been used to having athletes in the past, such as the Brownleys, which I think has really helped. Well, I know it's another big tick for the school. What do your classmates think to you winning this, girls? Oh, they've been so yeah. supportive. It's been really nice. They're just so excited for us, uh, which is it's so sweet. Oh, and it's super cool as well. I mean, look at those medals. <laughs> yeah. They're amazing. So what's next for you, girls? Um, I'm going to do fell running over the summer. Uh, I've got the British Championships in two weeks. And then hopefully at the end I'll be able to compete for England, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'll just stick to mountains and trail running this summer. Well, good luck, girls. What adventures you've got ahead of you. I know you're playing hockey in South Africa as well, aren't you, over the summer? Yeah. So, oh, my goodness, to be 17 again. <laughs> Fantastic. Well done. Thanks for Thank coming Thank you. In. Thank you. Now, this weekend, thousands of other runners, not quite of that calibre, but they'll be taken to the streets in Leeds to take part in the annual 10K Run for All. This year, the event, which has raised millions for charity, falls on Father's Day. So, following on from the Rob Burrow Marathon last month, his three young children will be pushing their dad, the former Leeds Rhinos legend, around part of the course. Phil Bobmer has been to see them in action. Macy May, are you looking forward to doing the run on Sunday? Yeah. yeah. I'm super duper excited. And who, who do you think is going to win? Me. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to win. Some family time ahead of Father's Day in the Borough household. For Rob's three young children, Sunday promises to be a little extra special, as they'll be pushing Dad around part of a Leeds 10k course. Mum Lindsay says they're all looking forward to it. Yeah, um, definitely. I think Macy and Maya will. I can. I think I'll probably end up carrying Jackson some of the route round. But um, you know, the brilliant kids, just a bundle of energy and, and so much energy and joy. I wish I had their energy half the time. But um, yeah, I think they'll really enjoy. And I think again, the support um, from people on the streets will be amazing. The Leeds 10K has grown to become one of the highlights of the city's events calendar, where people of all abilities can take part. Five, four, three, two, one, go! For Macy, Mayer and Jackson, it'll be a lovely way to celebrate Father's Day. Well, I'm very excited to push Daddy round because he's such a special dad and everyone will be there to support, and especially on Father's Day. I think we're going to run just under one mile, one point something kilometres. It'll be a real exciting because some children won't get to do that and it'll just be a great experience, and especially on Father's Day, it's just amazing. And you must be really proud of your dad. <laughs> yes, I am very proud. The Leeds 10K was Jane Tomlinson's vision, raising £1.8 million for charity while she was battling terminal cancer. Fifteen years after it began, that spirit of inclusivity lives on, providing inspiration for everyone, for Rob and Lindsay and their children. Rob's happy, you know, just sitting in the garden watching the kids and, and being around the kids. Um, that, that's his sort of happy place. You know, he idolises the children and he's such a family man, so I think being able to do this run with the children on, on Sunday will be really special. These are precious moments for the Burrow family. On Sunday, for them and for everyone else taking part, they'll enjoy some more. Phil Bodmer, BBC Look North.
Good luck to everyone taking part on the Sunday. Paul, I know you were very taken by the hay fever chat. You, oh, you're yes. full of your own tips, aren't you? I'm on antihistamines all the time. Uh, you've heard the one, <laughs> don't hang your washing out. That's a good one. But uh, naturally, on a sunny day, as temperatures rise, the wind picks up and it lifts the pollen into the higher atmosphere. And then when the wind calms down on an evening, all that pollen descends to the ground. So actually, an evening and early on, is really bad. But anyway, enough of that waffle, because I've got some fantastic pictures to show you of Windscar Reservoir. This was this week, last year, and you can see how low the levels are, but wow. Sandy's very kindly taken a picture yesterday, and you can see the levels are much higher. And we've got two more shots as well. Scar House Reservoir, this was September the 1st last year, and if we fast forward to the pictures that we've got from today. You can see again Scar House, which uh, serves Bradford's drinking water much, much higher. If you've got any pictures you'd like to send to me, you can see the addresses are on your screen right now Twitter, Instagram, and on the Weather Watcher website. So the headline for tomorrow it's dry and it is sunny once again, although there could be a bit of patch cloud at first and again later. A tiny chance of an isolated shower maybe across South Yorkshire, but virtually all of us will be dry. However, Changes are afoot. Now, we've had high pressure for over a month now, which is remarkable in itself, but it does look as though at some point timings are open to doubt at the moment, but at some point we will see this low pressure pushing in. This particular chart's got a risk of showers on Saturday in the west, but it's more likely to be a later on Sunday and certainly next week feature when we do at last see some rain. But there's, there are no clouds on the satellite picture at the moment, certainly no rain in the short term. So it's another wonderful evening out there as you perhaps uh, head out into the garden after our day's work and later we'll see a little bit of patchy cloud in places but most of us will be clear and we'll see temperatures coming in at around about 8 Celsius that is 46 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow's high water time is finally 302 and again at a quarter past three so a bit of low cloud perhaps that'll be gone by eight nine o'clock and then it's clear and sunny for most just there a hint of the odd shower breaking out as temperatures reach their maximum values but very much the exception to the rule we'll see top temperatures around 26 a bit up on today's value 79 fahrenheit lovely day friday saturday a risk of a shower but the risk really comes in through Sunday and certainly into next week. Some rain on the way by then. That's the forecast. Hay fever sufferers will be happy with that little bit of rain that's coming. I'm going to have to go home and bring on my washing back indoors <laughs> and wash it again. That's it from us. We'll be back at half ten tonight. Keely's here. Bye-bye. <laughs>